afternoon to you all from Johannesburg, South Africa. Yes, so we've got 48 minutes down to go on the floor on the rundown, but I think we, we're quite good to get it started. It is at 12.31 on this live broadcast in such a time as this. Uh, yes, my name is Seth Nyker, reporting to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa, on in such a time as this. Dear friends, it's such a beautiful honor that we have to do conversational story sharing and thought leadership today as a part of uh, the august month when we focus in south africa more especially on the rights of women and um and 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 overcoming some of the gender-based violence the uh, femicide the sexual orientation violence that is happening in our country we want to take a moment to reflect uh, and this this phrase comes to mind. Watinta bafasi, watintum bukoto. Now you have touched the woman, you have struck a rock. And we remember our leaders, Rahima Musa, Lillian Ngoyi, Helen Joseph, and Sophia Williams. On the 9th of August, 1956, those uh, four women that I just mentioned, together with 20,000 others, marched onto the union building with a petition to end the past laws. So friends, this is the month we get to ground and galvanize our ideas, hopefully to bring around some positive change. Um, we've been doing this uh, online broadcast for the last uh, four months of lockdown here in South Africa. And today, as a part of the lineup, this is our show. We have in the 12.30 slot in the middle of this hour. Uh, it's such an honor to bring to us and South Africa and the world, Dr. Tara Yung Kyung Chung. And she'll be joining with us in this hour. And then we return at 3.30 p.m. with our dear friend and colleague, uh, Lebuhang Mashaba, CEO of History Makers. So that's the lineup for the day. Oh, and guess what? Right here, right now, I have Dr. Chung, who's already in studio. She's all ready and, and rocking and coming to us live from Korea. So let me bring her in. And there she is, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Chung, how are you? Hi, Seth. It's great honor to be invited by you. I the love honor is all mine and all ours. <laughs> Yes, I am so honored, and I am um, enjoying my sabbatical in my uh, own home country, Seoul, Korea. Uh, I'm working at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, but I got uh, two years of sabbatical, so I'm working on my books in Korea, and Corona happened. So I could not go back to New York City. So I'm enjoying being in uh, my home uh, due to this uh, gift of Corona. Yes. The gift of Corona. Yeah. And as you know, this uh, Korean uh, system uh, of dealing with the Corona is one of the best in the world. So I'm benefiting feeding from uh, many health workers in my own country. Wow, it's, it's, so, it's so amazing that you say, you know, the, 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 the gift of Corona in Korea, because mm -hmm. I know also they say, uh, Churchill said, don't waste a good crisis. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how has it been there? I mean, we, we obviously in such a time as this, we deal with a lot of our different topics, but uh, it seems like Korea is doing really well dealing with the pandemic. Can you just yeah. give us a bit more about what's going on in the country? Yes, I think uh, a basic democracy and transparency and many good people are trained in medical system. So now is the time for them to really show their ability and also there are a lot of action of solidarity even you know in my country anybody regardless of your nationality if you are in korea 
you are treated for free for coronavirus. And if you stay in Korea for six months, you have a free uh, uh, medical insurance for everybody, including foreigner. So this is possible, even I knew it, <laughs> because in USA, as you know, if you do not have health insurance, which is so expensive, you just cannot go to hospital. But here, I didn't, you know, ask for my health insurance. But when I stay here for six months, government uh, mailed me health insurance. So not just for me, all the foreigners. I see this is, uh, you know, solidarity and hospitality. This is something I have to honor this hospitality and solidarity. I wish many people in the world, regardless of their rationality and, and economic uh, ability, they have uh, this universal uh, health insurance. I think it's a human right. Wow. Doc, I'm, uh, it's great to have you here. We know we've done lots of work to get, uh, get us to this point. We're so grateful for the technology. While we're not in the same room, this virtual space allows us to do like we do on in such a time as this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Enjoy mm -hmm. a cup of coffee. I don't know what you've got there, so, you know, just give you yeah, a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so friends, those of you that have joined us, uh, I, I, will, I will just allow because some of my own mentors and friends that are in the country, uh, South Africa, Dr. Nontando Adebe is online. She says, thank oh. you so much for looking forward to listening and lis looking, uh, listening to you and Dr. Chung. I don't know how much they'll be looking forward to listening to me, uh, but we've got Nontando Adebe and then another colleague and, and fellow minister uh, in the Anglican church working in a place called Falmut, very close to John de Grouchy. Uh, Reverend Bona Terry Jacobson. She says, oh. wonderful to see you, Prof. I was in your class at Union in oh. 1997. Oh, my God. Oh, oh hi, hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> so there we, there we have it. Some folk that, are, that know you from way back when. So, friend, mm. uh, the way that we do this is I want to I wanna give some, some, for those of us that don't know Dr. Chung, there are many people who know you. Um, and there are some people that may say, Seth, how did you get in touch with Dr. Chung? We can save that for another day. Uh, but <laughs> my way of building this connection to you, many years ago when I was writing on Black Liberation Theology, Marisha, mm -hmm. who Dr. Chung, you know well by now, uh, my mm -hmm. friend, my partner, my confidant mm -hmm. and mentor, and I would say on the mm -hmm. other side of the relationship, my wife, Marisha oh. introduced me to a book called Voices on the margins, and inside mm -hmm. that book, there was a piece mm -hmm. written by you. And for those of you that have heard me in the reconciliation and justice space or the mm -hmm. diversity space, I normally would call on some words and I would talk about mm -hmm. for us to do the work of justice and reconciliation. I would say these words we need to move from lazy pluralism to active. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah. friends. Yeah. Those words, mm -hmm. and if you've read an article that I that I that I published on Sojourners, those mm -hmm. are the words of this dear Dr. Tara Jung Jung Chung. So that's mm -hmm. my connection to you, Doc. And here, let me read from your personal profile mm -hmm. and professional profile. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chung, Dr. Tara Jung Jung Chung is a professor of interfaith engagement and ecumenical theology at Union Theological Seminary in New, in New York. She has an international author, speaker, and activist in the area of interfaith peacemaking, ecofeminism, and women's spirituality. Mm -hmm. I always like to say, when you read from people's profiles, you get through the first uh, a few lines, then go to the dictionary and start finding out what that actually means. So just amazing vocabulary. But that language can shift us as we think about our world. Dr. Chung is a Christian theologian and a Buddhist Dharma teacher. She has been a counselor of the International Interfaith Peace, Peace Council. She's a lay theologian of the Presby Presbyterian Church of Korea. Dr. Chung once lived as a temporary Buddhist novice nun for a year in a Buddhist monastery in the Himalayas, studying medit meditation or mediation, I should say. 
She became a Dharma teacher at the Kwan Um Zen School of USA and a guiding teacher was Zen master Shung San from Korea. Yeah. She first came to international attention way back when in 1991 when she made a radically challenging presentation as a keynote speaker and echo feminist Asian third world interpretation of the Holy Spirit at the World Council of Churches uh, in Canberra, Australia, a historian of World Council of Church called her speech the most controversial speech of the history of Christian Council. She defines herself today as a psalmist, Korean echo feminist from the Korean word salim, which means making things alive. Professor Chung's teaching and research interests include femina, feminist and ecofeminist theologies and spiritualities from Asia, Africa, Latin America, Christian Buddhist dialogue, Zen meditation, disease and healing in various religious traditions. Friends, I could go on and on and on, but today Professor Chung tries to synthesize the wisdom of the worldwide people's movements, spiritual legacies of world religious tradition, critical academic analysis and arts in her theology. Amongst many things that she loves doing, she would also say to you that she is an artivist. Yes. Not just an activist, <laughs> but an artivist. <laughs> Friends, without further ado, it's really, it's our time to get into conversation with this dear Tara Yung Kyung Chung. Welcome again and thank you for being a part of our online broadcast. Oh, thank you for such a beautiful, generous introduction. I'm very honored to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Because, Wanya, mm, yes, I want to. I want to thank you for the honor. And as we go into it, please, um, I know that in 1991 there there came this this kind of emergence of your voice on the international arena. But not too far from then, there is a connection to you in the South African landscape. Mm -hmm. where we hope to see your voice starting to, if I may say, vibrate mm -hmm. in the rhythms of liberation theology much mm -hmm. earlier than that time, but around about 1991 and then 1992, you came mm -hmm. to South Africa. Yesterday mm -hmm. in our prep, you told us a little bit about this. Can you mm -hmm. just take us back there for a moment when you connected with Albert L uh, Nolan in Soweto? Yeah. Yes, uh, 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 the Dr. R. Professor Nolan invited me to give an uh, inaugural, uh, inaugural liberation theology lecture at Sueto. So it was a great honor because um, uh, the people struggle in South Africa to overcome apartheid is a kind of a symbolic, uh, iconic uh, victory in our time. Of course, this liberation has a long way to go and it is complex and it needs a lot of growth, but uh, these uh, people really achieved liberation from very long apartheid system, has given so much hope for people's movement around the world. So I was very excited to visit your country and I gave a, a first inaugural lecture at Sueto. Then I was also invited by South African Christian Women's Council. So I traveled small uh, women's communities around South Africa, including African independent church, engaging with women in South Africa. So it was one of the most Holy experience for me, especially in African independent church, dancing and singing with them. You know, Koreans are very spirited people. We have a very deep shamanistic uh, tradition that is uh, almost uh, like our mother religion, uh, like a cosmic religion. So when I went to African independent church in their uh, receiving the spirit, uh, activity, I just zoomed in. So it was a very holy moment for me. And also, I had a chance to go to top of the table mountain. And I just uh, 
lie down and smell the earth and smell the all these greens and uh, and that experience for me was so important because table mountain has a, such a energy and you know after this experience i have been teaching bishop tutu this forgiveness and nelson mandela long way uh, for freedom so it become more um, embodied you know when i think about south africa and your struggle uh, it really touched me with the South African people I experienced, also South African nature I experienced. So, you know, uh, thank you again uh, to uh, give me this opportunity to reconnect with the South Africa. Well, Doc, thank you. And like, like I'd like to just reiterate, it's such a great honor to have you in the work you've done, the books you've written, and now this time, in such a time as this. I mean, our world is facing, um, if I may say, uh, multiple pandemics. And when we launched the show, we were, we were obviously taken by storm, if I may say it like that, with the coronavirus. And then on top of that, I would say compounding effects of the global issue of racism coming mm -hmm. and becoming iconically presented through I cannot breathe or mm -hmm. I can't breathe mm -hmm. in the passing away of George Floyd. We ourselves in South Africa have seen mm -hmm. the passing away of people by, uh, you know, the militarization uh, mm -hmm. of, of, our, of, our, of our defense force and the mm -hmm. military treatment of people in irregular ways. And so mm -hmm. we have seen how uh, the bodies of, our, by and large, black majority people and not just black people, you know, in a racialized South Africa, we were talking in many ways of, of others as well that have been lambasted with irregular treatment in this time. And then on top of that, uh, like I mentioned to you in our prep, uh, this month where we get a chance to talk about women's lives and women's choices, uh, to focus on the reality that women face still as second class citizens. In one of the previous shows, uh, one of our colleagues as a leader, a uh, mm -hmm. human being, but also as a woman leader said to me, Seth, I'm not just black, I'm black times two because mm -hmm. of gender-based violence in our context. And so, uh, you know, it's a great honor to have you here. One of the, one of the words that come to mind from your profile uh, before mm -hmm. we get to the next moment, I thought if you can just speak to it, you take mm -hmm. on now this embodiment and the identification of, or identify it as an eco-feminist. How does this connect with your work in, in liberation, in your pursuit of a liberation theology, a theology of justice, mm -hmm. a, a theology of redemption? How does this, this label of ecofeminism work in that space? Yes. Um, when I study feminism, and I also see this massive destruction of environment and earth, I found that the, women, the people who suffer the most in this multiple pandemic is women and children from poor countries or poor classes. So liberation of earth and liberation of women are directly connected. Because traditionally in our metaphor, men are portrayed as culture, and women are portrayed as nature. So, you know, one of uh, the anthropologists uh, from Korea, she's working for UN and Kim Soon Young, and she said, if we call Earth fathers, not mothers, Earth will not be, would have not been destroyed this much because wow. we see earth as a mother in this patriarchal capitalism we have a, this a subconscious collective uh conscious subconscious of culture is oh you cannot get away with mother you know the mother will forgive you father will punish you but mother will forgive you accept you no matter what you do 
That is a kind of a mentality we have in patriarchy. So all as men are, we are living in a, a very dualistic, hierarchical world, whether men are more connected with the spirit and God, women are more connected to the matter and earth. So in this uh, ladder of existence, which Aristotle uh, developed, and this dualism of, uh, you know, Platon, and the women and men are separated, earth and uh, God and this spiritual world are separated this is a very uh, biased worldview which created many kinds of oppressions based on our differences. Differences are not the base, shouldn't be the basis of discrimination. Difference is something we should respect and learn and celebrate together, you know, to learn how to coexist with the differences. That's the way to peace. You know, I have been working with the International Interface Peace Council for 20 years with, you know, like your, one of your luminaries, like Bishop Tutu or Dalai Lama and many Nobel Prize laureate. And in that process, what I learned is peace means holding the differences. When we learn how to hold the differences, difference doesn't become a basis for discrimination or otherization or demonization, but differences are something which make our cultural immune system strong because, you know, in a natural world, diversity always make a nature ecosystem very strong. Like a Vandana Shiva uh, from India, she's uh, one of the most famous Asian eco-feminists. She said, we have to learn from the forest. She called it forest principle and feminine principle, which is based on mutuality, reciprocity, and and uh, the respect of diversity and sustainability. When we really learn from this principle of a forest, forest principle, human uh, community also can have much more, uh, much better immune system. We tolerate each other more. With this tolerance, we build a healthier community and more sustainable community. So for me, I just cannot think of feminism without thinking about respecting Earth and respecting this ecosystem because when this ecosystem is destroyed, destroyed the person who, who is affected most is mother and children. Like a mother's breast milk is polluted and the poor woman's drinking water is polluted. Like in India, when all these um, you know, agricultural uh, companies, they make GMOs like Monsanto and these big multinational uh, companies, they develop a suicide seed which means the seed doesn't produce seed. They mm. just produce one time of uh, product and they die. Then farmers, they have to buy the seed from these international companies. And in that process, we lose our indigenous seed. So ecofeminism really addressed the fundamental issue of how we can live well on this earth with the people and with the earth which means we also 
have a right relationship with the creator. Therefore, I'm moving more and more toward eco-feminist studies because Corona is a message from the universe. Mm. Tell us, stop. This is a 911. This is an emergency. Do you want to choose life and death? No more, because there are how many international environmental meeting like a Leo meeting, Paris meeting, and world leaders, they signed the paper, but they didn't follow up what they promised. And, you know, the political leaders didn't follow up. And economic leaders, they have this uh, uh, mentality that unlimited production and unlimited uh, sales they will uh, produce wealth but no that will ultimately destroy this mother earth and we will all die together like a titanic you know there's a first mm. class uh, uh, second class third class of course third class people die first but all of us will die together. So Corona basically uh, tell us, okay, stop the way you live, the way you think, the way you think about the wealth, the way you think about community, the way you think about politics, economy, the way you think about earth, this is not going to work. So. It's is a call for repentance in a way. Repentance means you change the direction. You are in a wrong direction. So you change the direction of your life. So I just see a corona not just as a you know pandemic curse on humanity. I see it as a blessing to say, stop. You know. Mm. You have already heard that for the first time in New Delhi, after 30, 40 years, they see first time Himalaya mountains and Ganges, the, the fishes, they come back. Even in Venice, dolphins come back. And, you know, all these animals, you can see clear in Los Angeles, there is always a smoke. They see blue sky in Los Angeles because people are working in their house. So even because of these airplanes, they are not flying so often, you know, this ozone the holes in the pores, it is closing. So this is amazing miracle Mother Earth is giving us, like uh, self-organizing this uh, power of Mother Earth to say, okay, I have given you so much, so many opportunities, but you have not listened. So now this is what you need to do. Mm. It reminds me of Native American story. There is a story of a loving mother. She loves so much. She loves her children so much. And they came as a mother, we need the money and give you uh, uh, the land. So she gave land. and. Oh, we need more money, give you a house. Then she gave house. Oh, give you an orchard. So she gave. Then they come as mother, we need your leg. So mother gave me leg. And they said, Oh, mother, we need your arm. So mother gave their, her arm. And only she has a head and body. And this spoiled children came back and said, Mother, we need your head. So at the very moment, mother just swallowed them all. She just ate them all. <laughs> you know, that is the story I heard. I think that is what is happening right now. So we stop asking so-called more, uh, you know, the more wealth, the more position, but we have to really look deeply into ourselves 
and what is a true, what is good life? Wow. What is beautiful life? What is true life? Why we are here on this earth in this time? Who we are? We have to ask this fundamental theological question again. So that's what I try to do in my eco feminist, a salimist in Korea. Salim means woman's everyday work, like uh, raising children, cooking, and you know, farming, and healing. We call it salim, but literal meaning of salim is making things alive. So when she touches, everything becomes vivid, more fully alive, full of life. So rather than using this Western world, eco-feminist, I use Korean indigenous traditional world from women's tradition, woman's power, Salim. So I call myself a Salimist. And I see Korean eco-feminist theology is a Salimist theology. Beautiful. Friends, so if you're out there, we are with uh, Dr. Uh, Tara Yung Kyung Chung. And I just want to say, as I make a connection to what you just said, Doc, many years ago, my mom and my mm -hmm. dad reminded us that by mm -hmm. taking us away from the from the South Side Joburg existence of, mm -hmm. of South Side Johannesburg and getting us away with, we didn't have too much, but the little they had, they sent us away for a yearly camp. And as a young man, while in my area, there were not too many trees. There was much more dust around, you know, and, and uh, yes, there was gardens and so on. But I'd like us to begin to think where there is marginalization, where there is poverty, where there are people that are left out and set aside. There is also the reality of a denunciation of appreciation nat uh, uh, nature. And my dad and mom reminded us that by getting us away to this beautiful campsite in, in Mahalisburg, oh. at, 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 a, at a campsite called Kayara of Youth for Christ, mm -hmm. I began mm -hmm. to appreciate nature. I began to appreciate, uh, you know, the air. I began to appreciate beautiful scenery. Mm -hmm. And I want to say to us that, uh, Doc, and even as you were saying that, to you, what's sitting in my mind is, for many years growing up in an apartheid state, mm -hmm. I started to question, like you just said, a great theological question. Who am I? Yeah. And when we came to this question, as persons of color, we mm -hmm. were already in an apartheid state. People who are mm -hmm. not white told that we are less than. Mm -hmm. okay? And I always began to wonder, how come people would care for the earth, love the animals, prioritize growing beautiful trees, but mm -hmm. hate on their fellow humankind? And so yeah. this connection yeah. has become important when we reclaim mm -hmm. our lives, reclaim our our mm -hmm. our space in the earth as mm -hmm. as loving the earth but there's so much beautiful connection to mother earth a song comes to mind many years mm -hmm. ago i used to sing it like this thank you mother for giving me a chance to live thank you mother the gift of god the gift of life only god can give uh so even as you said friends can we begin to think of earth as mother earth can mm -hmm. we begin to of God, even as, as Mother God. So, Doc, sure. thank you mm -hmm. for those entrance words into the space. But let me bring up this little poster we have. Mm -hmm. It's in, uh, it, in light of South Africa, those of you that are out there, we are remembering in this month, August uh, 9th, uh, 1956, more than 20,000 women marched onto the Union buildings with a petition to end the past laws. Okay. Led by Rahim Musa, Lillian Ngoyi, mm -hmm. Helen mm -hmm. Joseph and Sophia Williams. I hope wow. that by ending this month's reflection with Dr. Tara mm -hmm. Yung Kyung Chung, mm -hmm. it, it, it allowing us to become aware we are gender equality generation. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we require can happen now and here. So, Doc, that's what we are reflecting on, and thank you for beginning with us so beautifully. We want mm -hmm. to cross over to this moment now. Those of you that see uh, the, the wonderful, beautiful work of Dr. Chung. We're going to get to a moment where we just step inside for a moment behind the title, behind mm -hmm. the organizations, behind the great work, and take a moment for a story. But the best way I know how to do this uh, is to take uh, allow us a, a moment to rest from the screen. 
So Dr. Chung will remain in studio with me, but we want to take a moment to preface this story sharing through what we've come to know in South Africa as What's Your Story? A beautiful way to show an inquiry journey toward the other, whoever the other may be, whether it is a, an, another of race, another of gender, another of another class, another religion, another way of being, how is it that story and narrative can draw us closer to this other? Today, let us watch this beautiful video from the national campaign, What's Your Story, that has already reached 18,000 plus people in our country, providing them a chance to utilize their stories as a way to build empathy, understanding, and trust. Let's take some wisdom from, uh, from, the, from the collection pot of Heartlines in the beautiful work of What's Your Story. Let's check this out. The world moves fast around us. Sometimes it feels like a blur. We pass each other and make judgments of each other constantly. You're doing it right now, seeing this woman across the street. We cross and recross, but rarely connect. We struggle to understand each other, so we don't trust each other. I know your name, but I don't know who you are. You know my name, but do you know my story? What would help us see beyond our perceptions? Story. Our stories are what make us human. Stories have the power to overcome our perceptions. Sharing a story isn't hard. It's a simple human act. Connecting us deeper to people we already know. Reach out. Ask. Invite. Then listen. Truly listen. Stories have the power to overcome our perceptions. They help us understand. Ask. Listen. Tell. It's our way of building our nation. Heartlines has developed resources to help you on this journey. These resources will empower you to build understanding, trust, and reconciliation through personal storytelling. Imagine if we were part of a powerful wave of change. One story at a time. We all have a story to tell. What's your story? For those of you that have come to know that beautiful campaign, it's also linked with a beautiful movie that's called Beyond the River. I'm, I'm quite honored to be associated with Heartlines. Today we have in studio Dr. Tara Yung Kyung Chung, who just already in the first segment has kind of explored with us this work of being a psalmist, eco-feminist, returning our eyes and our focus to Mother Earth, to an ecosystem that is in balance. And even considering with us, what can we draw from the corona pandemic to be learning and understanding? Some of you have made some beautiful reflections online where one thinks upon different immune systems strong, uh, feminism respecting the earth, um, relations between patriarchy and exploitation of the earth is well stated and reflects everyday references to mothers and fathers normalization of patriarchy that is embedded in our societies and religions. Just through the, the, the way beautifully shared by Dr. Chung, um, we, are, we are journeying deeply. So friends, you may have not known some of this before. Maybe you know the, the academic, you know the writer. What an honor we have in this moment to step behind the title, get behind the story. The story that's behind the story, here she is. Let's take a moment to learn of the story the personal story of Dr. Tara Yung Kyung Chung. Doc, mm -hmm. it's so beautiful having you in studio. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to take this moment to, to listen to your story as people learn from your story. But what got us to where we are today? Today we see you as you are. We've come mm -hmm. to recognize you. People have come to respect you around the world. But I know that in that true tradition of Salmonist eco-feminism, there's power in story and connection. 
please share with us your story. Yes, I I was uh, from the beginning when I was born. I was born uh, from the surrogated mother, so I didn't know that I have uh, three mothers in my life. Maybe it could be a uh, tragedy for some people, but I got so much from my three mothers. So I see it as a blessing. And I am a product of a Korean student movement. I, you know, as a student, I joined the uh, anti-dictatorial and democratization movement. So I was kidnapped, you know, tortured and imprisoned like many activists in your country it is the same in our country when i grew up but in a way i feel because of, of many of us dedicated to build up democracy so we have a, one of the vibrant people's uh people's uh people made the democracy in asia and i'm very proud of many people who work for that democracy in my country. And uh, then, you know, uh, out of uh, so much suffering in my life through the struggle, I studied theology because I want to know all about this injustice and suffering. Why there are so much suffering if there is a loving God? The whole question of theodicy, how come this good God allow so much suffering in this world. And that question made me to study theology. So I was trained by Minjung theologian. Then I went to Latin America and I was trained by uh, liberation theologians. Then I was trained by feminist theologians. Then finally I was trained by black theologians especially James Conn, he was my doctor father and a really great mentor of my life. I think this is such a synchronicity and honor. Today is a James Conn's birthday. Wow. He passed away two years ago. Uh, but if he were alive today, he will become uh, 82 years old. So I want to, you know, honor this torch for James Cohn. This is a salt torch to, you know, to honor what he has done to me and to all the people of color in the world. Uh, you know, he just to say he's the first person said God is black. Jesus was black and you know, the lynching tree in USA, the way they killed black people, that is exactly the cross. He, his last book, The Cross and Lynching Tree, is a, such a powerful book. He was uh, struggling with the cancer. And when he finished that book, he passed away. And he really poured out uh, this, uh, his uh, love for this book, The Lynching Tree, and his uh, last book, you know. Uh, so today, I think it's not an uh, accident. Um, it is a real synchronicity, like what Carl Jung said, you know, it is uh, universal energy coming together. I, on James Conn's birthday, I can talk about my story, because I cannot think about my theological journey without James Cohn, you know, through him, I read, you know, Alan Bosek's work and also many South African uh, theologians work. And basically when Christianity cannot honor black people's life, metaphorically, uh, literally black people, also metaphorically black people who are marginalized, oppressed by system. That is not Christianity. That is mm. not Christian theology. That really, 
it gave me a language of liberation theology. You know, when I learn liberation theology from Latin American perspective, I learned about class struggle, but I cannot learn about racial struggle. But only working with James Cohn, I can see the core of racial struggle. And, you know, I have been working uh, at Union Theological Seminary now almost, you know, 25 years. And when I worked in uh, basically white institution, no matter how great the house institution, there's almost a subconsciousness of uh, this uh, uh, original sin, which is original racism. Mm. Because they are born and raised in a racist society. So without knowing it, many white people in, in the white majority world, they have this subconsciousness of white supremacy. And it takes a lifelong self-reflection uh, and multiple uh, repentance to recognize how deep it is in our every cell. Not just white people, for people of color, we internalize racism so much. Mm. How many you know people think fair skin, white face is more beautiful? You know, when I taught at uh, Harvard University as a uh, 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 guest uh, professor, you know, I casually talk with the Harvard faculty, and I was so shocked. All black Harvard faculty married to white people, except mm. one who was a chaplain of uh, Harvard University chaplain. He married to uh, uh, black women. But when I was taught at Harvard, which is 1994, uh, around that time, I was shocked. Oh my God. All the uh, really su super intellectual black people, they chose to marry white women when they arrived in Harvard, you know. What does he say? What does he say? So the racism is not just for white people. Our people of color, we have uh, so much internalized racism. So when I was young, because I have a darker skin in Korea, and I have a very round, uh, the almost indigenous face. So when I was young, nobody told me I'm beautiful. Only when I went to USA, people said, oh, you're so beautiful. <laughs> in Korea, even, you know, when I was in church, uh, church uh, school, um, Sunday school in my high school, many of my church brothers told me, Hyun Gyeong, you can never win with your face and the, your beauty. Therefore, you have to study hard. <laughs> you can only uh, make your space in this world when you study hard with only your brain because you look, you can never win. You know, that was the message I received. So it takes a long time for all of us to get out of this bondage of racism. So, you, you know, the, that is my intellectual background. And then I have been working with this International Interface Peace Council for 20 years. And I visited the conflict areas in the world to try to bring the message of peace and learn from their struggle. And in that process, I felt you know, I don't know how to really overcome my own suffering. 
that's the time I learned meditation. So I think in my tradition, Korean Zen Buddhism has a strongest tradition of meditation. So I start to practice meditation, then I went deeper and deeper and deeper to the degree I can live as a novice nun for a year in Himalaya mountains. Then I become a Buddhist Dharma teacher. So, you know, my uh, quest was how we really get over human suffering. Because of that quest, I joined the uh, democratization movement, the feminist movement, ecological movement. And lately, I discovered that unless we really see unconsciousness, subconsciousness of our own self and people's deep psyche, we cannot have a, a true integration of liberation. Wow. So, and systemic change and deep, deep psychological, spiritual change must go together. So I have been trained for almost five years now in holotropic breastwork, transpersonal psychology. So after that training, I become a, a psychotherapist, spiritual guide, and life coach. So I try to combine all these toolbox of liberation uh, mm. to uh, integrate the deepest, best, inclusive liberation for all. I think that kind of uh, truly inclusive liberation, personal, systemic, political, economic, ecological, spiritual, I think that is a shalom we have been talking about in Christian theology. So, you know, in my lifetime, in my small way, I try to bring these wisdom traditions of humanity and bring the integrated voices of liberation and healing in our time. Yeah, so, you know, with that kinds of things, I try to have a lot of uh, workshops with young people. Even today, I went to city and I just run back for this uh, uh, talk with you. We are uh, producing uh, what is the message about COVID-19 for the transition of a civilization. So we have, uh, we will have uh, uh, we will produce a multi-dimensional uh, poetry, drama, and dancing, and music, and image, designs of uh, multi-layered performance uh, in Korea uh, at the end of the month. And I feel so moved by creativity of these young people, how they see a new vision, what kinds of a new world is coming to them. And I want to be a old grandma. I'm a, such a paisty grandma now. I'm 64 years old. <laughs> so I want to be there. So I will uh, be in that uh, uh, whole performance as a corona goddess. <laughs> <laughs> as a corona goddess, I brought this message to humanity as a goddess of corona. Isn't that fun? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Doc, thank you for taking a moment to, to share with us. I have a surprise for you that I'll bring to you in a moment thank and you. also to all of us because there's a beautiful connection here uh -huh. And I, I just must honor the way you've spoken about black liberation theology. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you that are listening, we have many people that are online. I want to mm -hmm. say to you that we don't only focus on the rights of women and children, more mm -hmm. especially in the month of August in South Africa, but this mm -hmm. must be a part and parcel of our lingo. Mm -hmm. I love the way you shared with us your journey 
this mm -hmm. archive if you like of life that is journey mm -hmm. and if i heard you correctly uh, i too can connect with your story in light of having not just one mother but in our culture which is an african indian culture i would mm -hmm. talk about my mother which is my biological mother mm -hmm. my big mother and mm -hmm. my small mother which are <laughs> of my mothers so those of you that are out there reclaim your story if you're out there and you know that you got your biological mother mm -hmm. but your biological mother may have been so young that she wasn't really your caregiving mother mm -hmm. there might be this other mother that took the role for many of you that would be your granny mm -hmm. your grandmother mm -hmm. and if you are, if you are identified as a man out there kind of begin to connect with this mothering that has happened to you and what kind of maternal nature may be uh, required for you to pay homage to to draw mm -hmm. from the strength of your mother so we can correct the imagery and our language if you're a theologian out there how do we even in this month and beyond this month begin to talk in a mothering way mm -hmm. a way of, of, of maternal connection and love and compassion where we we bring it into our our communities of faith mm -hmm. so doc what a beautiful journey and and lastly i just want to acknowledge how you told of the connection to black liberation theology because mm. like you know you've mentioned alan busak busak mm. will be, will be uh, i i just messaged him in the week he'll have a new book that comes out in in january mm. and a lot of my research was built on that back of of uh, or that trail i should say of black liberation mm. theology a contextual black liberation mm. theology but mm. i love the language of which which we would talk almost of what does a liberation theology of inclusion look like? So those of you that are thinking out there that liberation in and of itself cannot lead us to a place of being liberated from only to enslave somebody else. No. Liberation cannot be a liberation that would say, I want to love the earth, but I hate the black man. No. Liberation cannot be a liberation when I say, oh, I love Jesus, but please don't tell me he was black. And mm -hmm. so in light of that beautiful tradition of black liberation theology for dr dr Hyang kyung chung who's in studio and for all of us out let's take a moment to hear the voice of dr james james cone wow let's take that moment right now Wonderful. If God is in the world where people are abused and exploited, what then is God doing? This was my question as I wrestled with the fire that was burning inside me. Christians are called by God to plunge themselves into the world on behalf of those who are voiceless and hurt. The great Russian writer Dostoevsky said, quote, there is only one thing I dread, not to be worthy of my suffering, unquote. As I reflected, on that saying in relation to black suffering, I said, there is only one thing I dread, not to be worthy of the life that the suffering of my black ancestors have made possible for me. Beautiful. That is my teacher. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I miss him so much. You know, when he passed away, it almost seems like a light went out, you know. So, but you know, some, uh, we have to carry our torch. Uh, you know, what he has, uh, Mm. We've got to carry that torch. Yes, and you know, since uh, you show his uh, the speech, you know, when I first become his doctoral student, he said, 
And I tried to write a real great intellectual paper. So I gave my first paper and he said, Hyungkyung, you have a sin of profundity in your paper. You try to be so profound. Don't write in this way. Write about what hurt you the most. Mm -hmm. That was the turning point in my theological journey. So, you know, still I hear his voice. What hurt you the most? Write about that. You know. So, great teacher. Mm. Wow, this is, this is a beautiful moment. So, if you're out there, those of you that are coming from wherever you're at in life, what hurt mm -hmm. you the most? Write about it. Put it as a positioning towards the way you lead. Whether you're in a church, you're in a non-profit organization, if you're out there in, in the corporate world, when you can connect yourself to where you felt the experience of being hurt, like Howard Thurman may say, living with your back against the wall, you know, how, how then can you then continue to do the hurting to others? Uh, here in South Africa, uh, um, Dr. Chung, we are we are having to consider our economic realities. COVID-19 is turning up and exacerbating the fact that we already have had 25 million people out of our 60 plus million people living in less than, uh, you know, positions of human dignity, less than what is the required earning, I mean, less than a thousand rand a month, which is maybe if I said, you know, if I had to say one, one is to 10, dollars it's about a hundred dollars even less but we have that reality and how can we government leaders church leaders npo leaders right across the terrain begin to shape a new future mm -hmm. a, a, a future that is connected where our mm -hmm. theology is match, matching our practice and our practice is matching our theology where we're seeing a beautiful future through churches through mm -hmm. religious organizations through corporate organizations. Why? Because we can't leave things like they have been. I mean, I was in one academic setting, Doc, and uh, unfortunately, the academics, they were saying, well, you know, when things get back to normal, <laughs> come on now. You know, if, if, if I no, might just... No, no. Who no, wants no. to go back to a normal of injustice? No, no. Who wants to go back to a normal of, of environmental degradation? Who wants to go back to that normal? We need to be designing a new normal, a normal where... Yeah where it's actually back to the design that God had intended for us. Mm -hmm. So, Doc, uh, lastly, as we close, and I don't want to spend too much more of your time, what is in this time, if we think upon uh, Tara Yang Kyung Chung speaking to the world, what will be your call to us of action and service for creating this brighter future, this sustainable future, this equitable future, this liberation theology future? I, for, for me, I want to give livable earth. Doc, and if, the, can I please ask you to come a little bit more into the frame? Yes, uh, yes. I want to uh, give the really sustainable, livable earth for the most marginalized, oppressed children of the world. Uh, my goal is, as an adult person, I want to give this earth really livable for next generation, uh, like uh, Native Americans says, seventh generation, generation after generations of children, especially most marginalized children, they can still still have uh, these blessings of earth because, as you know, when this pandemic hit, the most vulnerable connection is the poor mother and children. Mm. So that is my focus. So you know, today, I want to give you some teachers theology for uh, the black uh, women, or South African women uh, theologians and the women. Uh, there is a teacher said, how is God? She's black. And also they said, 
good woman only go to heaven, bad woman can go everywhere. So I want women, all women, believe in their power. They have a power to change. And you talk about you need so much justice in South Africa. You know, as an activist, I don't believe that we need a good political leaders and economic leaders, but what will make a fundamental change is people, people power. Come on now. Every one of us have to recognize how much power we have, power to change. So when we make a small change for justice, like a, a everyday justice in a small a dose, but it become a ripple effect, like a butterfly effect. You know, when you have a, a little butterfly in Amazon, there's a you know, avalanche in Himalaya. So my theology is not tiger, elephant, and lion theology. My theology has changed ant, spider, and butterfly theology, which means we really have a very small but strong, healthy ants. We can make uh, so many holes in this patriarchy pyramid and they, it can collapse. Then, you know, what we can do, we can make a connection, like a web of a connection, like a spider. Then wherever we are, out of our power, our inner power, our collective power, we make, a, you know, butterfly, uh, the action, flying, little flying, then our, that way, would it change the world? That is a conclusion of my, you know, almost 50 years of social activism. Every one of us truly believe the power of change we have already. Wow, Doc, I, as, we, as we're listening to you today, thank you for taking the time uh, on behalf of Marisha and I and the organizations that we are a part of here in South Africa. Uh, I'm hopeful that the power of story will continue. We're grateful for the work we're doing with the South African Council of Churches, with the South African Christian Leaders Initiative. We're grateful in our own community for the work we're doing at Via Christi Community Church. And today, mm -hmm. as you've shared with us, we will share this resource uh, mm -hmm. with, with people. And I hope those of you that are out there that you've enjoyed um, Dr. Tara Yang Kyung Chung in, in just her sharing. Uh, I want to spend a moment. Let me let me show you how we do this conversational uh, style. Mm -hmm. Doc, you said that you believe this is such a, a an amazing moment. I think you call it a, a synchronous moment, a moment of mystic wonder that brings us on August 5th. May I ask you a question? When is your birthday? My birthday is May 15th. I leave it at that, dear friends. You heard it right here on the show for the first time. She said it herself. Marisha just told me about it. Your birthday is on May 15th, and so is mine. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so many, it's a double synchronicity. Double many, synchronicity. Yeah, double, you, you call it how. And then, because, because I'm feeling the flavor to savor, uh, we're going to close this off in youth style. You know, I, I started out my life as a youth worker. Uh -huh. uh, I love young people. If you're out there, we got to see our emerging generations arise. So there's a song from South Africa that has gone on Twitter. It's gone around the world. I, I, I put it up last week, but it's called Jerusalem. And I know that, you know, around Israel and Palestine, there's a lot. But can you imagine that we all have a place, a soul space that we want to take ownership of? I mean, a beautiful description of a very problematized place of the world is that Jer Jerusalem actually is a global land space for all people. Not just some people, not just powerful people. And mm -hmm. Doc, as you said it today, maybe those of us that are out there that want change, myself included, I need to be thinking less of the theology of the lion, but more of a theology of the ant. Those of you yeah. that know Reverend Dr. Kerry Lubber, he spoke about the story of a white ant, uh, just a beautiful mm -hmm. metaphor of how as a little ant, he started to move inside the colony. So as we close out the show, 
we'll take this moment to, if you like, in South African flavor for around the world, we're going to jive. Great. Yes. Doc, thank right you. On. Doc, are you ready? All right. Let me see if you got some flavor to savor right there. Uh, a piece mm -hmm. by our own South African artist here that's rocking the charts around the world, Jerusalem. Uh, oh, nice. Let me just set this up. Mm. Okay, so there we go with Dr. Chung. We're going to close off in such a time as us in style. Come on. If you're out there, what a wonderful way, a beautiful moment with Dr. Chung. Wow. If you got your vibe, keep it alive. <laughs> well, Doc, you can check it out. Uh, uh, it, I'll give you the honor to say the goodbyes because we've co-hosted the show today. Those of you that are out there, I will get the contact details of the web page and the website. There's many other projects Dr. Chung is busy with. Uh, there's some life changes about him moving into Korea. Those of us that want to be a part of this global community where we can draw from her own journey, I believe there are many of you that feel today connected to the story. We got to okay. take liberation in a new way, in a new rhythm toward our future. It may mean our shifting from power over dynamics to working with, journeying with, and even as I've listened today, I've been blessed. So, Doc, I give you the honor to close off the show today, and then we'll say our goodbyes. Okay. Greetings to you. All the blessings to you for your peace, happiness, and justice. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, we will be in touch, and uh, thank you for taking the time from, from ourselves here and all those that have been listening and the organizations we are part of. Uh, we we, we want to thank you very much. Thank you. See you yeah, Take care. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. So, friends, uh, what an amazing time with uh, Dr. Chung. Uh, I, just for myself and Marisha, we are so honored. That was our 12.30 show. Uh, I will uh, bring this resource out to you via YouTube if you are interested. I figure there are lots of people that would like to take out some of that connection through. But we've had the honor to be with one that has actually practiced what she's believed and continues to change, continues to seek out a way toward a better future, an equitable future, a sustainable future. Uh, in my own role as a growing person in the space of development, in theology, in the work we do in different spaces, I want to say to you all, I hope that you've been blessed and that we've, we've actually in some way blessed you with the, the words of Dr. Chung. So uh, peace out for now. See you all around at 3.30 when we join with Lebucheng Mashaba, another colleague of mine who's done some amazing work here in South Africa. And I'm so honored that Lebu will be joining us at 3.30. But again, a special thank you to Dr. Chung. So see you all at 3.30. Thank you and goodbye for now.